What's up, Legacy Builders? I'm Rob. I'm Rishon. And, and this, this is Learn, Learn Hustle, Hustle Grow. Grow. We help you build wealth and explore entrepreneurship so that you can leave a legacy. She's a travel agent. He's a realtor. And we are debt-free entrepreneurs. Guys, today is a special day. We interview Danielle. Uh, it's This subject is near and dear to my heart because it's real estate and she does tax liens and property preservation. Yes. So she's talking about property pre preservation and tax liens and she's going to give us a scoop on how to get into the business and just how to create a business of your own in this space in this real estate space that is unique from any other. I will say I think one of the things she shared with us is there are over 50 different ways to work in the real estate industry. Yes. I'm going to have to find some more of those avenues because I want to tap into everything. Squirrel. <laughs> and she also <laughs> talks about the importance of focusing. We know that you are going to see this interview for what it is, which is an opportunity to learn and grow. Yes. Check it out. All right, guys. We have an awesome, awesome entrepreneur joining us today. Danielle Pierce is a woman that does it all, does it and all. we are so excited to have her joining the Learn, Hustle, Grow audience and sharing with you legacy builders how she is creating a legacy of her own. So Danielle, thank you and welcome to Learn, Hustle, Grow. What's up, Danielle? Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's such a pleasure to be here. We are so excited. Well, you know, this channel is all about money and entrepreneurship, and we want to hear repeatable processes that our legacy builders can share with their families. Mm -hmm. They can find other ways to create a revenue stream of their own. And we know you've got a couple of ways of doing that that are very different from what we do. So excited to hear your story. Let's start by telling us um, how you feel about money. Give us your perspective as far as your mindset around around fi personal finance. Oh my gosh, how much time do we have? Like I can think <laughs> about that. So it's money is a, it definitely a, a conversation that you know has lots of moving parts and variables. I would say that early on I thought money was very scarce, difficult to come by, that money comes, money goes, you get money and it like literally, like money would literally burn a hole in my pocket. Like I always heard that growing up as a kid. Mm -hmm. And then when I started experiencing it, I was just like, wow, I this is a real thing. And it's it's weird how no one ever sat me down specifically and said, this is something that you need to know about money or this is how money works. But you just learn things from your environment and how people around you act. So everyone around me pretty much didn't have any money. And so they always were like struggling and broke. And, and, I, and it became normal for me at the time for people to get paid on Friday, be broke on Monday or get paid one week and then um, have to struggle or ask for gas money for the next week. So that was kind of the norm for many, many years. And then as I got older, I realized that I had adopted those same mindsets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took me, so I have an accounting degree. I went to U of I, I actually have a master's in accounting. So Ooh, it took me going on with <laughs> to college, starting work in corporate America, making what I thought at the time was a lot of money, which it wasn't. Um, getting laid off, which I thought I was ready for. Also, I wasn't ready for that. And then kind of blowing a few lump sums of money for me to finally start to shift, for me to finally start to acknowledge that mindset and then to start to shift it. So it took a very long time, easily until I was probably late 20s, early 30s. Okay, Danielle, thanks for letting us know uh, about your background and money. Tell us about your business now as sure. entrepreneur. Yes. So I've actually been an entrepreneur for, this is my 13th year full time. Wow. I mentioned a few minutes ago that I was laid off. Um, and again, I thought at the time that I wanted to be laid off and I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. This is a sign from God. <laughs> Are you, are you were happy? <laughs> Most of us wouldn't be happy. We'd be terrified. But yeah, that's because I didn't know any better. So oh, I was okay, like, okay. it was kind of like the naivete of youth and just being ignorant. I didn't even know what that I should not be happy about it. I thought I was ready to be a business owner. And I thought that I knew what, what that encompassed. And of course, I didn't. So mm -hmm. I struggled for quite a few years trying a bunch of different things, all within real estate, but never quite. Um, you know, making money in any, making a lot of money that I wanted to make in any specific thing. So about six, seven years ago, I came across um, 
an industry which where you basically get contracts to with banks to do repair and maintenance on bank owned properties. Oh. So I was like, oh. oh, wait a minute. You said you came across. Yeah, yeah. That was kind of glazed seen, over. Yeah, there. Say, I've never <laughs> seen that job posting. Yeah, yeah, glazed. <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> so I was actually, so I've always had a real estate license. So I'm actually oh. a managing broker. So the broker that I was working with at the time, he was doing it. And I was, and, and prior to that, I was initially, I initially wanted to be the, the listing broker for the foreclosed properties, but that is a very tight kind of good old boys network. And it's difficult to, to break into. So I couldn't break into that one. And so when I, when he told me about that, I was like, oh, I'm going to do that. So I actually named my company Platinum Realty and Preservation. And I got, I gave it that name about a year before I even got my first contract. So okay. that was the reason how I got into, or how I learned about that particular industry. And it actually is a great fit for me because it is allows me to make the money that I want to make, have the team members that I want to have. And then also, of course, there's lots of flexibility once you get it uh, properly established. And it is not as client centered as being a traditional real estate broker. So I mean, that's a question. I, I do hate to interrupt. Uh, do you have to be a, re a licensed realtor or a broker in yeah, order to do that's this? That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. No, you don't. I get that question a lot. No, you don't. Okay. Uh, you don't have to be a licensed real estate broker. You don't even have to have um, a general contractor's license or you also don't even really you don't even have to have a college degree. So it's just more wow. so about being able to. Yeah, you have to have a business, though. So you have to set up an actual business, okay. get the proper insurance, pass a background check, um, kind of lay the foundation. And then from there, it's just a matter of applying to get your first contract to cover um, whatever territory you wanted to cover. Okay. So I found out about that business and I've been doing pretty well in it ever since then. A couple years after that, actually, I shouldn't say that. My second business is because um, I have two primary areas of expertise, tax lien investing. So I heard about it years ago from... Uh, okay. I don't even remember where I first heard about tax lien investing, but I dismissed it and blew it off. I was like, oh, that's a mess. Uh, that's a scam. There's got <laughs> <laughs> Like everybody says. Uh... Yeah. And, and it's weird because I'm in the industry. So a lot of people think when you're in real estate, you know everything about real estate. And I'm sure you guys can relate to this. People are like, oh, yeah. can you tell me about overages and wholesaling? And come I'm like, no, I don't I do not do any of that stuff. I'm so yeah. houses, yeah. houses. That's all I do. <laughs> there are so many different facets to the yeah. real estate piece. Yeah. And what you said about people thinking that it's a scam I swear that just speaks to the mindset yeah. that we all have, right? When our knowledge is limited on something, yeah. we think that it can't be a real opportunity. Yeah, we got to investigate, but we got we to do better in, in, at investigating. So. so what I found is that most people think that because they can't do a certain thing, that other people can't do that thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I made that mistake too. And wow. then they came across my radar again a few years ago. Actually, about five five years ago, I was watching... I think Periscope. I was watching a broadcast on Periscope and I saw somebody talking about it and I was like, it clicked for me. It was like, oh, I'm going to do that. So then after that, I went to my very first sale. And again, it was like a family reunion for, not for me, but for everybody else who was there. They all uh -huh. knew each other. It's like high five. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is so cool. And then that's where I got my first two vacant lots. And I just kind of kept going from there. So I always tell people to make sure you even go to an auction in real life so you can get that experience uh -huh. because it, it kind of the visual does a shift that all the talking and YouTube videos in the world won't do. Right. Okay. So, okay. So let's, let's take it back a little bit. Like on the tax liens, uh, like I really don't exact, I don't understand exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. So okay. you're saying you have to go to an auction, mm -hmm. right. To buy a lot. You say you went to buy a lot or a house or whatever, mm -hmm. but why, why do they call it tax liens? Yeah, can so you explain that for our audience a little more? I can. So when I'm referring to tax lien sales or auctions, so it, it, it isn't a real auction, just like the stereotypical ones you see on the TV. Yeah. And basically it is a way for the city, the local government to recoup lost property tax dollars. So every city pretty much has a mechanism where they are like, okay, if you're not paying your property taxes, we're going to essentially put just, put this property in on the market to the highest bidder, wow. and then we will get our money that way. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that mechanism exists just just about everywhere. Now, some places have the sales um, once a year. Some some places will have the sale twice a year. Some will have one sale every two years. Just depends on how large the city is. Mm -hmm. uh, but the process does vary quite a bit from location to location. So I always tell people to focus on a county and a state versus just saying, oh, I want to learn about tax liens. Like, well, learn about tax liens where? 
and then like also, in county, right? Okay. Yes. And then also there's a difference between a tax lien and a tax deed. So a tax lien certificate just gives you an ownership, an interest in the property. And it's a pretty significant interest because mm -hmm. it kind of supersedes everything else except for, of course, the IRS. You know, nobody's okay. trumping them, right? <laughs> 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 so if the property has a federal tax lien, um, you pretty much will still deal with the IRS in some capacity. Like they just don't go away ever, just like mm -hmm. the same for student loans. Um, so you have an interest in the property. And then at that point, it's kind of a, a waiting game. So there is what's called a redemption period where the owner can say, hey, I came up with all the money for the penalties and the t uh, back taxes and the interest and the fees, mm -hmm. and I'm going to pay this balance and then kind of relinqu relinquish your claim on my property. Mm -hmm. ah. And they can do that even after you've already, you know, gotten hold of the as deed. Long as it's during, no, no, no. So there's a, if we're talking about a lien, there's a redemption. Okay. okay. Because it's within that redemption time frame. Oh, oh but a deed. Do that. Okay. So if we're talking about a deed, the tax deed split out into two categories, redeemable deeds and non-redeemable deeds. Ah, okay. okay. Redeemable, that means that, yes, I have the deed to your property. However, you can still come back and cancel this whole process um, right, if right. you do it within a certain time frame. If it's a okay. non-redeemable deed, that means that you buy it, it's a done deal, and it's over. So okay. with all of that being stated, people have to take a step back and figure out, am I a lean person? Am I a deed person? And if I'm a deed person, do I just want the deeds that are mine right away? Or am I, am I okay with waiting? Everybody doesn't have that, um, can't handle that waiting game. And they're like, nah, I don't want to deal with all of that. That's too much. Right. So, so just let's, take a, let's take a pause right here, Danielle. Because we are students. We're going to school with right. you right now, just <laughs> yeah. like, you know, our, just like our viewers are. So like, they are learning from you in this moment, but yeah. so are we guys. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to recap from teacher Danielle. <laughs> 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 so, Miss Danielle, we have both tax liens and tax deeds. Yes. yes. Tax liens have a redemption period. Is that yes. always or that does that depend on where you're doing it? Mm -mm. If it's a tax lien, there's always going to be a redemption. Okay. The time okay. frame varies, though. It could be four okay. months. It could be three years. Okay. Oh, wow. It could be three years? Wow. That's incredible. So, you could lose the property that Danielle bought or got bought the, the tax lien on in three years. What do okay. you get out of that if they take that back, though? Uh, interest. So you get ah, back what okay. you paid plus the statutory interest, which could be, if I had to put an average, I would say 10%. Uh, some places okay. it's as high as 25% or 18%. Okay. So if you are investing a pretty significant amount of money, that's a pretty great return. So okay. that's what people get out. And plus your attorney's fees, you get that money back as well. Okay. okay. So now we have the tax deed. Tax deed. deed. Yes. which is redeemable and non-redeemable. Right. Yes. Do those have interest yes. on them as well? Yes, they do. Okay. They do. So you're always going to get something out of it, even if they take it back. You will always get something out of it as long as you are um, working with an attorney and filing the proper notices. So every it's a it's kind of a complicated process, but after yeah. you buy a lien, you have to send out, uh, I think it's a series of notices. I don't even know how many. It depends on the state, but it might be as many as eight. As long as you're if you're follow if you're following the steps and you um and you buy and the owner redeems you'll get your money back plus interest plus attorney's fees. So Danielle, you've told us um, you've given us some great insight from the perspective of tax tax liens and tax deeds. Yes. But you have a second portion of your business which is property preservation. Right. We talked a little bit about how difficult it is to actually break through there. So tell us how you got started and you know what you do in that business and if somebody wanted to start in that business, how would they do it from scratch? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I think it's a great business to get started in because the uh, the income potential and revenue potential is very high and the barriers to entry are relatively low. Um, and by that, I mean that you don't have to have your college degree, no high school diploma. So you don't have to be like, you know, high honor roll or like uh, graduate with a certain amount of honors from, from college. Like none of that stuff matters. You do have to have a business and the business can be any structure that you want, even a sole proprietorship, which I I don't necessarily recommend if you have the money to do something else, but that is an option still that's considered suitable. So you establish a business and then you need um, two, possibly three types of insurance. Mm -hmm. One is general liability. One is errors and omissions, which we all real estate agents are familiar with. And the third one is workman's compensation insurance. Um, you may or may not need workman's comp insurance depending upon where you live. 
uh, which state that you live in, but it's a possibility. And then from there, it's the background check. Now, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on the background check because I do get lots of questions on that, believe it or not. Okay. <laughs> People are like, um, the emails I get are just crazy. Like, um, <laughs> like exactly how much they need to know about me. Yeah. Or what if I just get a little bit of crap? Right. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten that. I've gotten that. <laughs> Or it'll be like, oh, I got a felony um, from some, 15 years ago. I stabbed my, no, some I stabbed my my ex-girlfriend or, or ba- I'm just like, oh, it is. Yeah, you it didn't is. have to tell me all of that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but no felonies. I do know that. So no felonies. You can oh. misdemeanors will allow you to still just obtain like the highest clearance. But I don't know which one specifically. But I know for a fact that you cannot have any felonies. And if you do, then you take that business and you put it in. You have to work with someone else. Husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, best cousin, best friend. I don't know. And once you do that, at that point, you're just applying for a contract to cover a specific um, territory. So I typically tell people to cover like two or three counties is ideal. You don't have to cover a whole state. That's a whole bunch of work. But you could. You can also work outside of the state that you live in, but I don't recommend that. Um, most people just don't have the attention to detail that that requires to make that successful. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then from there, it's just a matter of scaling to the level that you want to get to. Hardest part is finding good sub subcon- good subcontractors. Okay. okay, so tell us exactly what you do as someone who preserves a property. What is property preservation? Yeah, that's a good question because people always think it's like flipping a house like HGTV. Right. So doing, um, <laughs> basic repair. So think of a property in your neighborhood or maybe somewhere you where you've driven by and maybe the grass is five feet tall. Maybe the gutters are falling down. Maybe the shrubs are overgrown. Maybe there's a bunch of trash or debris in the yard or inside the property. So you're doing any, all of those things that I just mentioned um, to that specific property. Um, mm-hmm. And then if you're in a place where it gets cold, like Chicago, um, and let's say the pipes are frozen, then you're going into the property and maybe you are thawing the pipes. Maybe you're taking uh, the basement is flooded. You're taking the water out of the basement mm-hmm. because oh. water extraction. Uh, if there's mold, sometimes you'll get into mold remediation. But I typically will outsource that to a third party. Mm-hmm. You're doing all the landscaping, snow removal. Um, board ups are very, very common. And every now and then you will do an eviction as well. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. So it's inside and outside of the house. I thought it was only outside. Mm-mm. No, if it's vacant, it's inside too. And the oh. evictions, of course, come from people who have been in the the foreclosed property and they just refuse to leave. So oh, wow. they're, they're, they're evicted. So you go in with the sheriff? Yes, I don't because uh, I don't really <laughs> do too much field work, but I have done a couple of evictions. If I had to say one area where it can be a little bit sketchy, it would be the eviction. And for obvious reasons, the emotions are high. You know, people, they a lot of times they act, they don't know the specific date, but they do know that they're going to be evicted. Okay. So okay. let me say that. So it's not like a complete surprise how some people will act like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I didn't know I didn't take my uh, mortgage for three months. <laughs> but the sheriff does come in in Chicago. They come, they bust down the door and they uh, throw everybody out and they leave. That's how it works. Wow. Um, and in places in Texas, uh, it's a similar process. They come and they're a little nicer here. Like they may knock on the door and tell everybody to leave. But yeah, you going to get out their property that day. Like right then. Yeah, right there's then. There's no, no 72 hour. Uh-uh. After the eviction <laughs> comes, that's it. So you've been in business 13 years total. You reference both Chicago and here in the DFW area. Did you do both businesses in, have you done both businesses in both places? Uh, I've done preservation in Chicago, of course, and then also still here in Texas. Tax Mm -hmm. liens, um, I have not bought tax liens in Chicago, only because the the, the redemption time frame in Chicago, which we were speaking about earlier, is for two and a half years and time. So, okay. So Texas is shorter, you're saying? No, no, no. Texas is uh, Texas is up to two years as well, unless it's not homestead property, then it's only six months. But I just, Texas sells deeds and not liens. So it's just, and plus the interest rate is higher here too. Um, do, doing business in Chicago, I don't want to throw shade on the city, but it's just, it can be a little sketchy sometimes. Yeah, yeah. We <laughs> <Okay>. understand. <laughs> All right, Danielle. So what is it, what would it take to get started on either one of your businesses uh, from scratch, if someone wants to get into this right now. Okay, so for preservation, we already talked about starting up the business, setting up a business structure. Yeah. 
Okay. So we don't hire individuals to do the okay. to do this type of work, getting the insurance pass and the background check. So then from there, in terms of finding the companies to apply with to get these contracts, you could do a couple things. You could, of course, work with someone like myself, which mm-hmm. if, for those of you who are not willing to do that or not able to do that, the next option then is to uh, you could drive through your neighborhood. And, you know, all the foreclosed properties will always have signs on the front door or on the front window. That's where we have to stick them at. You would start there. Those are called the basically the servicing companies. And you could just call that number and find out, hey, do you need vendors in this area? And that's one way. And that's kind of like a free tip that I tell people. because People are like, oh, oh, I never thought about that. I'm like, yeah, I know. And it's so cool. And it works. It works. And then for tax liens, um, the process to do that is also quite simple as well. you would contact the local tax assessor's office where you live and just say, hey, when's the next tax sale? (laughs) And then they're going to like refer you to the tax sale department if they have one or they'll answer that question internally. But that will put you on the path to learning more information. Um, Tax sale information, a lot of the stuff we like to think is like very secretive and mysterious and people like are hiding it from you, but it's kind of public record. Yeah, um, just like a lot of things are these days. <laughs> so yeah, it's public record. You would start there, and they'll tell you like if the if there's a registration fee, what's the process, where's the list of properties. Now, as far as the analyzing the list and all of that, you'd have to either work with somebody else to get help with that part independently. But just getting the information is the tax sale department. Okay. So you mentioned that people might be able to work with you. Yeah. I know that our audience is going to say, "Well, how can I get more information?" and and does she teach this? Is there a way for me to learn from Danielle? So why don't you go ahead and just tell us now, do you teach both sides of the business? Because, you know, depending I, on who's watching, they might be interested in either or. Or is it hard enough? Uh, I do teach both sides. <laughs> um, and you could just go to real estate, realestateprofitlab.com to get yeah. that information. And also follow my YouTube channel. You can get information there as well. But yeah, I teach it. I'll put a link in the in in the description, yeah. definitely okay. to Without both the down. website and to your channel to make sure that people can get more info. Okay, works for me. Awesome. All right, so now let's talk about the money. Yes, yeah. let's talk about the money. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, how much revenue do these businesses produce annually, Daniel? Okay. So most of my revenue comes from property preservation. So preservation, the first. Five months, actually six months, we only made $29,000. And then the next 12 months, we made $332,000. So within wow. oh, that months, is some serious cheddar. Yeah, so within, within 18 months, it was multiple six figures. Um, and and everybody can do that. That's And that was with one county, uh, Cook County, actually, in, uh, in Illinois. So it can be done with one county if there's enough volume and one company, too, as well, working with one company. So on average, uh, average revenue f- ever since that point, which was 2014, has always been like three, three fifty. The highest was like four, four twenty five for one year, but okay. it's always over three hundred thousand um, dollars. And I've kept it there. I could go a little bit higher, but with me doing the online coaching and the other stuff, I've kind of had to kind of level it out a little bit. But I mean, the sky's the limit for that. You could go. You could just pick up another county pick up another county until you got to the point where you want it to be. But also keep in mind that you're also managing more and more subcontractors and they are the devil to deal with. Um, It's just challenging with so many different personalities and getting work done. And I'm, and I'm a hundred, I outsource everything. So if you have the skill set, which so many of my people that I talk to do, if you have the actual skill set to do the work, then you are even farther ahead, way farther ahead than I was, because I didn't know how to do anything and still okay. don't. But I know how it should be done. So I kind of like when I was um, I was a caddy for when I started when I was 13 years old. I actually got a scholarship to U of I from being a caddy. So I know about golf and I know what to do, but I just cannot do it. Play. <laughs> okay, let me click on the pause there because I need to make sure that the Legacy Builders heard that college hack. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, college hack. Yeah, yeah. Yes. She went to college on a scholarship after being a caddy. Man, y'all better get that knowledge. Stop playing. Yes. It's the <laughs> Chick Evans Caddy Scholarship. Wow. And it's still around. And I didn't know that it was around. I didn't know that it was a thing when I started caddying. I just knew that I needed money. So that's Who why. Who came I- up with that? Did your parents notice that or you noticed it? I did. I was, okay. uh, I'm a reader. So I was at school. 
freshman year, I was 13 when I was a freshman and I was in the, like the counselor's office, principal's office. Okay. And I saw a sign and it just said something about money. And I thought, <laughs> well, whatever it is, I'm going to do it. And that, that's how it happened, literally. <laughs> And Danielle, you told us actually how you feel about money and kind of how you moved from, changed your mindset as it pertains to money. But, you know, you're doing all of this and and I believe that you have a family of your own while you're running these businesses. Yeah. Right. So, you know, there are a lot of people who will say, oh, she can do all that because, you know, she doesn't have kids or she doesn't have a, a job. Yeah. But, you know, we want to kind of get rid of those self-limiting beliefs right. and address the fact that you are doing this as a parent, right? Yep. Yep. I am. So I have an eight year old, seven year old, and a five year old, soon to be, well, their birthday's all right, right? So it'll be nine, eight, and six in a couple wow. months. And um, still running and, two businesses. Yeah. And it was really rough in the beginning. Um, I, I, I'm like a halfway crunchy mama. So, like, you know, I'm all <laughs> into natural things and all of that. So I was nursing for all these five years straight. Yeah, it was rough. Wow. It okay. was rough. <laughs> wow. And still running a business. I heard that. See, it can't be done. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so, so you told us about the revenue on one side, right? Yes. Oh, so for tax liens, so tax liens, I do. So the the let's see the vac the some of the properties that I bought I still own, so I haven't done anything with those just yet, but but kind of hang on to them. Um, I know that in twenty was it seventeen or eighteen I got four properties for three thousand dollars this was in indiana wow what? i was gonna ask you how much do you need to have for those type of things wow. oh, yeah. you so got the actual properties. Mm-hmm. yeah they were actual properties and they didn't they get recode back uh pictures <laughs> and videos of, of some of them one of them i never seen the inside of but all the other ones i have seen uh one was redeemed so the owner got that property back so no big deal there and then i sold those properties for five thousand each so that was still like a four thousand dollar profit roughly so it's not as much money when you do a wholesale like that but it's you kind of get in and get out and go on to the next property um and then my clients have done collectively about a hundred properties so far and those are in various stages of um being remodeled and put back on the market and flipped so it has been going um it kind of took off and, and it's been going pretty well so now, do you do any flipping? You mentioned that you just held on to some of the properties. Is it because they were in such bad shape that they couldn't be repaired? Or, you know, what does that it look so like? so much work or what? Yeah. So flipping, I know that it, it's, it, it looks to be so glamorous on TV. Yeah. And it's so much That's fun. We're asking. With whole teams, which everybody <laughs> doesn't have, right? Yeah, it, it's. <laughs> I find it to be very stressful. And it just yeah. adds to my stress level in a way that I don't like. I'm like, I, there's got to be an easier <laughs> way. Than this. I mean, I'm actually going to do one. I have a property in Memphis that I got for five thousand dollars. Wow. So I'm going to go there. I'm actually going to do a, a a flip on that property, but I'm not really excited about it because I know that it's it's a lot of moving parts, yes. and you have to be really good with um really have have a really good attention to detail and be good with managing a budget. And most Americans just suck at managing budgets. I'm just going <laughs> to most people just cannot do it. And then you have to stay on top of it. So it's a lot of concentrated effort. So and I know top, I flip. Yeah. I've done it and I will do it again, but I, it's not my favorite thing to do. Okay. okay. So how long would you say that it took to be profitable in both of your businesses? So for both, I would say it's about six months. So for, and you know this from real estate, you make money in real estate when you buy. So if you're buying at the right price, then the the equity is kind of built in. So six months for tax liens and um, also for property preservation as well, about six months. Okay. So within the first year, that's pretty good. And how much capital did you have to have up front in yeah. order oh, to yeah. get started on both sides? Because that's what they're going to wonder. Yeah. That, you know, how much that's money do I need? Does it really take money to make money? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> so... I'm going to give you a good example about that for tax liens in a second. But for property preservation, uh, two to 3000 is like the bare, bare minimum. Of course, with any business, more money is always better. It just makes life easier. But I wouldn't go below 2000 at all. Actually, I'm just going to say 3000 for property preservation. Startup costs. For tax liens, although you can get properties for $500 or $1,000, you will need more money than that because there are attorney's fees involved and then you'll also need money to uh to flip the property or renovate the property 
or rent it out or whatever it is that you're going to do. So at a bare minimum, I would say five. Like I really like people to have at least 10000 for tax lien investing mm -hmm. just because it gives you more options. Because what I don't want is people to think that it's 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 low cost and then they only have that amount of money and then they're stuck with a property I, that they don't have money for. Like yeah. that's the that I want to people avoid. So yeah, more money is always better, whether that be lines of credit, credit cards, whatever the case may be, but you're gonna need more money for tax liens. Wait a minute, so on the tax lien though, also, uh, it, is there a lot of competition though? You probably need more money because of the competition too, right? Or no? Sometimes. So uh, places like Tarrant County, very competitive. It's kind of like a madhouse when you go down there wow. um, on to every Tuesday, the first Tuesday of every month. Um, but in terms of competition, I mean, there's so many properties, though, you guys, that you just have to set your max bidding price before you get there. Yes. So you don't get caught up with the adrenaline and like, I'm going to beat this person. And then you only pay for a property. <laughs> Okay. Do you also choose which houses before oh, you get there? Or do you say, hey, I'm just going to have this money. And if I can get anyone with that money. No, you do all that up front. That's all the work that nobody wants to do. Like the gla not glamorous, not sexy work that nobody likes to talk about. Yeah. It's a lot of like looking at Excel spreadsheets. And yeah. for me, I'm into color coding and tracking and taking notes. So that's all the work that's done beforehand. Uh, the okay. auction is just like the, the show, right? But all yeah, the work yeah. is before. So Danielle, sounds like both of these are fantastic business opportunities. Yes. How did you know when you had the right idea? You said you tried something, some things for six years, six or seven years before you actually found yeah. these two. Yeah. How did you know when it was the right fit for you? That is such a good question. Because beforehand, I was I've done short sales, loan modifications, uh, of course, buyer's agent, seller's agent, broker price opinions. I've done a few thousand of those, and what I it wasn't so much that I I decided that these two industries were the best thing ever, even though I think that they happen to be. Mm -hmm. It was more so that I decided that I'm not going to change my mind and flip to anything else. I'm going to stick with these two things mm -hmm. until the day I die. <laughs> <laughs> you decided to focus. Yeah, I, I, I decided I was going to focus in a way that I had not done previously, because as you know, in real estate, there's like 57 different routes. And then everybody flashes a check. You're like, man, I'm about to wholesale today. You're like, no. Nope. Yes, that's me. That's me. Like, I'm, I'm, yes. going, I'm going to do multifamily investing. I'm going right. to do uh, commercial uh, retail or retail leasing. So it's that's easy. Real. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, you make are, money. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm selling houses, buying houses, but I'm, I don't know what else. Oh, I, mean, I, want I, mean, some, I want some of that too. <laughs> all these programs, and I'm not saying the programs aren't good because I think that more, more a lot of people say that stuff isn't good, but really you just didn't, you didn't even finish the program, right? Like you didn't even, <laughs> it, you didn't even follow it. You didn't even get through all the material, but now you're saying it's not good. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> you all this stuff and then you have kind of half, you know, half to do mm -hmm. it. And then you get halfway results. So if you do, you know, if you focus, you tend to get uh, more than mediocre results. You get phenomenal yeah. results when you focus. Awesome. You know what I noticed, Danielle? People start to veer off once they realize how much work is required uh -huh. yes. in making that business model work. Right. It looks fantastic until the actual work behind the scenes starts mm -hmm. to, you know, become evident. It's mm -hmm. all work, though. All mm -hmm. of it's work. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, Danielle, what mistakes do you, have you made uh, that you wish you would have avoided up to this point, if, if any? <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> that sounds like a lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I can't even believe that. Uh, yeah, I've made a lot. Well, for one, thinking starting a business with no plan, let's start there. <laughs> like when I was first laid off. I was like, oh, I'm just going to be an entrepreneur yeah. and didn't know, didn't have the business plan and the didn't have anything other than just this thought in my head. Mm. I would then also say not surrounding myself with other entrepreneurs early on. Like mm -hmm. I just recently got out of my one woman silo, like within the past two, maybe two and a half years. Before mm -hmm. that, it was just like me against the world. World. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to do all these great things. And you literally cannot go past a certain level when it's just you. So mm -hmm. you need other people. And then you realize that, oh, it's all these smart people out here. And my your next level is in a book, a podcast, another person, another, you know, mm -hmm. 
this interview here, like your next level is out there. You have to always be searching for it instead of just being focused on, you know, doing the same things that you've always done. Mm. Um, what else? Being bad with money for a long time was another uh, mistake that I made. But then I didn't even know that I was bad with money. Just spending money frivolously, um, mm. not having a budget, not if you don't tell your money where to go, you know, money just do what it want to do. Mm-hmm. That's true. Um, Mm-hmm. So I did that for many years. What I like with about what you're sharing, Danielle, is that you've had several hiccups along the way. Right. Yeah. And you are still successful. Right. You could have went back to corporate, you know? It's like, that's the scary part, yeah. right? That you I, hung I, in there. We're trying to stay out of corporate. We're trying to figure it out, right? So, you know, we, we, we feel you. <laughs> I um, actually did try to go back to corporate, though. Oh, did you? Uh, I tried, uh, and for the first time, I couldn't get hired. Yeah, it was the weirdest thing. I went on these interviews, and I just knew I had killed the interview, and I was going to have this job, and, and all my money problems would be over. I wouldn't be a broke entrepreneur anymore. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't get hired. I couldn't get hired. So I kind of had to say, say with what I was doing. That's what happened there. So it worked out. It, it was meant to be, I guess. So, Danielle, I want to say that you know, what you mentioned about connecting with other entrepreneurs, that is everything, right? So that's how we met you, yeah. you know, yeah. at connection with other entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial people here in the DFW area. Yeah. So I think that is certainly a great takeaway for other people who are trying to build their legacy through entrepreneurship is that you cannot go that next level as a solo act, yeah. right? It does help to connect with other people. Yes. Just having that same like-minded spirit, you know, in your mix, it can make a huge difference. It's very different. I mean, if you're used to working a job and when you start your business, um, and I'm sure you guys can relate to this too, like you, it takes a while to figure out that, oh, nobody's going to tell me to do nope. anything. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no paycheck coming if I, if I don't do it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah. Struggle is real. Yeah. So, yeah, you are speaking into everything that we are experiencing right, right now. Right at this moment. Yes. yes. Like, oh, don't turn on that Netflix, man. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's 9 a.m., man. <laughs> so, now, it sounds to us like you are very happy with where you are in your business. But mm-hmm. we always like to ask the question, are you happy with where you are? Do you feel as though you've made the right decision as it pertains to maintaining uh, and your your role as an entrepreneur? I am ecstatic with where I'm at right now. Nice. Uh, but I still have plans for this year, though, to, to triple what I did last year. But uh, oh, that was I, our next question. Yeah, you yeah. I, am, I am ecstatic. Um, but I also know that um, I was watching, did y'all see the article that came out? I think it was November of 2019. And it was about uh, Alibaba. They have a a basically a day that's equivalent to our Black Friday. Mm-hmm. And they made something like $113 million in an hour or something crazy like that. Wow. No, we did not see that. Yeah. Go Google it. Cause it, it'll, it'll, it'll change your life. You're like, Oh wow. That's, that's, now that's some numbers. And then even <laughs> yeah. at, uh, Google's parent company is now worth what a trillion dollars. Did you see that? So mm-hmm. there's like the infinite amounts of money out there. And I just want to, I've had to, since I've changed my mindset, my goal now is to help everyone else kind of work on theirs as well. Like, Mm -hmm. I I just don't think that we should limit ourselves. I think too many times we limit ourselves to this magical, I want to make six figures, Mark. And and then you get there and you're like, well. Yeah, it's okay. (laughs) Yeah, like that was highly overrated. Like, (laughs) (laughs) Especially once those taxes hit, right? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. And money is relative, right? It depends on what you need. Relative, but whatever your goal is, I think a lot of times we set these safe goals. Like you should just like 10x your goal, like right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Just like, you know, give yourself something to root for, because that way you you then you don't have room for to play around. Because you're like, man, I know I can't watch a whole series of Netflix in a day if I'm trying to hit this goal. Does that make sense? Right. So I, yes. I feel like everybody should set their goals higher. I love that about you, Danielle. Yes. Okay, Danielle. So how do you plan on growing your business this year? All right, so I have three things that I'm going to do. Actually, nope, four, nope, five. I have oh, a coach wow. now. I have a business optimization coach who's actually my friend from high school, but he's kind of a genius. Okay. And he is really good at, arc, uh, he's a process architect. So he's kind of taking everything at a very high level and making me do all these very painful things that I don't want to do in terms oh my, of oh, tracking. You. And, and ugh, it's just, it, it's a lot, but it's worth it. So that's one thing that I'm doing differently. I've had coaches before, but nothing like this. 
Uh, I'm going to continue to scale my Facebook ads. That's another thing. I just ventured into YouTube ads uh, a couple weeks ago. So I'm testing those waters out there. Um, I'm doing live events because, again, a recommendation from my coach because live events build community. Well, congratulations on finding that coach. Having someone who's in your network who's a genius, that is no small thing. Yes. (laughs) So, Danielle, we are... Uh, we really appreciate all the information that you have shared yes. uh, with us and with the Legacy Builder community here at Learn Hustle World. Again, we're going to make sure that we include links to both Danielle's YouTube as well as to her website where you can get the courses that she offers and learn more details so that you can figure out how to set up your own business, guys. Mm-hmm. But before we wrap up this interview, we are in the bonus section, yes. which is all about you. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So tell us what kind of books or, you know, what kind of inspirational or business books you've read that you think are so powerful they've had an impact on your life and could have an impact on the lives of others. Uh, sorry. So let me go check my Audible subscription real quick. I know that uh-huh. E-Myth is one of my all-time favorite books. And what is E-Myth about? E-Myth. It, it, it stands for the entrepreneurial myth. Um uh-huh. And it's by Michael Gerber. His name is Gerber. His last name is Gerber, I believe. But anyway, you can get the book in in real life or you can get the book on uh, Kindle or you can also listen to the audio book. But he talks about so many different things that I love. But one of the things that really jumped out at me was that he talks about when people start their business. And he said, you know, people think because you are good at making cakes that you should therefore open a bakery. He's like, those two things are totally unrelated. Mm. And as soon as I read it, I was like, you know what? He is right. Wow. Specifically, especially in the in the Black community, it's like we will start the same businesses over and over and over and over and over mm-hmm. again. And it's like we we don't think about other opportunities that are out there or we think that because you can really make some good fried chicken or you can really make some good soul food that you should therefore own a restaurant. And that doesn't mean that you should. It just means that you're a good cook, right? And it, the decision to have a restaurant is something that's totally separate. And we kind of blur, merge them together and just run with it. And that's why so many businesses just go like they tank because you don't know anything about running a business. Mm-hmm. I love the E-Myth. I love Profit by his last name is McCallowitz, I believe. First, but he yeah, talks about, uh, yeah, he basically says that we should pay ourselves first as entrepreneurs as opposed to paying ourselves after we pay everybody else. Mm-hmm. And he gave this one example that I that is so true. He was like, if you're an entrepreneur, you look at your account and you see extra money. The first thing you do is you find stuff to spend it on. You're like, oh, I need new business cards and photos and professional videos, yada, yada, yada. And then he said, if you look at your account and you see that there's not uh, not that much money, there are less than what you thought, then you you kind of in- instinctively cut back. So he says that we got to stop balancing our books based on how we feel when we look at our accounts and just pay ourselves first. And then he creates these buckets and it just makes so much sense. So I'm like, wow, I should have been doing this 12 years ago. <laughs> I'm going to get right on those books right yes, away. Both of both those of are them. new to us. So yes. we well, Father First, I had in my wish list. I just never thought about. I just don't like the cover. I don't know. Something about the cover. I was like, eh. I'll get back. I'll get back to that when I got twenty of them. This, up so. there. Like that. And then, of course, Good to Great is another one. Yes, um, I read that one. Yeah, Good to Great is another one. And then who else do I like? And the 10 next rule, Grant Cardone's book I like. And also Gary Vee's, one of his first books. I think Jab, Jab, Hook, Hook is another good one, too, as well. Okay, okay. excellent. Okay, Danielle, what does the term legacy builder mean to you? All right, so great question. So legacy builder for me means that, of course, we do our part to make sure that our uh, immediate circle is 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 well and satisfied and financially taken care of in the uh, event that we pass uh, well in the event that we pass early because everyone dies at some point. But I also think it's important to focus on the larger community as well. Okay. Uh, it's one thing to say, well, I figured it out, so you know my family is good. But I think that when everyone is doing well, I think it's when we can actually kind of shift things. Uh, in a permanent way versus just, you know, being in our little, you know, individual silos and everybody's working. Everybody's trying to do the same thing, but I feel like we could do more if we kind of, if we work together more, which is why I've made it a point to continue to reach out to other entrepreneurs and business owners and do more um, joint ventures and, and work in collective agreements, because I think that the impact is so much larger than just, than just me. Yeah. Awesome. 
And honestly, that's how we started the YouTube channel, right? right? And probably what, you know, prompted you to start yours as well. You are sharing your story and trying to reach as many people as possible, but you find that outside of your immediate circle, you need another vehicle to do that if you're going to help other people along their journey. Well, how long have you been on YouTube, Daniel? We didn't really talk about the channel much, and I know that, you know, everybody will be curious to see it, but how long have you been uh, doing videos now? Um, that's a good question. You know, I had a thousand subscribers in January of 2019. Okay. Got monetized in April. Nice. And then now it's just under 30,000 subscribers. So I feel like I've only been, I've only been doing videos less than a year. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. You moved fast. 30,000, huh? That's amazing. Yeah, it hasn't been that long. It's been less than a year. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story, for sharing your journey and for offering your time as a coach and making yourself available for people to learn from you. I think that's incredible. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Rashawn. Thank you, Rob. All right. Okay, one more time before we go, Danielle. Name all the places that we can reach you. Sure. So the best way to reach me is going to be to go to daniellepierce.com and subscribe there. Uh, awesome. Of course, you can find me on YouTube uh, under Danielle Pierce's name on the channel. Also on Instagram and Twitter. But if you find me on Twitter, uh, I probably won't find you for at least a year. So <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so mainly your website and your YouTube and Instagram. Yes. Absolutely. Excellent. All right, Danielle, thank you so, so much for thank sharing you. your experience, sharing your goals, and sharing your journey with the community here at Learn, Hustle, Grow. Uh, we know that our viewers will be extremely excited about all that you've had to share. And I hope that some people actually reach out and learn and choose to learn from you in order to build their own businesses. Absolutely. All right. Thank you guys so much. It has been an absolute pleasure. Can't wait to do it again. All right. Looking forward to working together more, Danielle. Okay. Guys, have a great day. You Bye too. Now. Bye. Bye. -bye.